A new study showed that active investments are better than passive. Is this true? Brian, I am excited to dive into this because it sounds like maybe everything that we thought we knew has changed. Maybe the investment world has now shifted and something we always thought to be the case is no longer the case. And if that's so, certainly we should tell our folks about it. Now, look, I, I think it's important to be transparent. Mm -hmm. We eat our own cooking. I think we need to let everybody know we love index funds. Yep, love We've em. talked about index funds for decades. And so it's one of those things where when I see a research study, especially from a professor at, 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 a, at a major a prestigious university like Duke University, and it starts getting press and then you guys start sending us articles on it i sit up in my seat a little mm -hmm. bit and i go well let's let's get to the bottom of this are active managers doing a better job than index funds and maybe you are not aware of this maybe you're not someone who's seen this there was recently a research study that came out and then a lot of article headlines have now been picking up the research study and you'll see stuff like this uh, Vanguard index funds lose out to its own stock picking fund. The own active managed funds at Vanguard are doing better than the index funds. So, uh-oh, that does not sound like a good thing necessarily. Well, now, first of all, some of you might be sitting up in your seat going, wait a minute. Vanguard has active managers? <laughs> well, why would Vanguard even have active managers on their roster? So I thought it was important just to kind of go back and do a little bit of a history lesson. Um, this question was actually asked of Jack Bogle mm -hmm. back in 2006 when he was talking to Paul Merriman. Mm -hmm. And here's what I think is interesting, because Jack, he, did, he didn't mince words. Look at what he said. He said, one, a lot of investors, no matter how persuasive the case for indexing is, and it's overpoweringly persuasive, just don't quite get it. They want a little more activity. They want something to watch. Index funds, as you know, are roughly as exciting as watching paint dry or maybe watching the grass grow. They create great returns, but they're not that exciting. So this was his answer to, okay, why does Vanguard make available active funds if you love index funds so much? And he says, you got to give the people what they want. If the people want some active funds, they want something a little more intrigue. Well, of course, we'll make available those products to the mass public. So let's let's kind of pivot and talk about were there any issues or concerns we had with the study once we dug into dug into the case. Well, and what they found was when they actually looked at the study, they found that 11 of the 16, that's an important number to keep in your mind, 11 of the 16 funds that they analyzed outperformed their benchmarks over the last 10 years. And I think this was 10 years ended at the end of 2022. So they said, uh-oh, it's overwhelming of the sample that we looked at. 11 of those 16 beat the benchmark. Mark, so maybe this is a paradigm shift. Maybe active management is onto something that we thought active management was not onto. Well, uh, and I want to get into this, and I even want to get that go. I'll bring it back to talking about what Jack Bogle, why he loved investing in index funds mm -hmm. in a second. But Bo, before we did that, I first want to draw attention to. I don't want people to lose the plot mm -hmm. or outsmart themselves because you talk about a lot of times that maybe focusing on investments in the beginning is not the most important thing. Not at all. When you're on the very beginning of your financial wealth building journey, we argue all the time that your savings rate is exponentially more important than your rate of return. So you shouldn't even be asking the question, okay, do I do active funds? Do I do index funds? How do I approach it? How do I attack it? The number one thing that you should be focusing on is how much can I save? How can I save more? How can I get more dollars working for me? Because if, if you can impact that decision, it's going to have a much bigger impact in your financial life than trying to figure out which one of these two investment options is going to outperform. So back to the point, don't lose the plot. If you're just starting your journey, this is wasting calories or horsepower when really you should be focusing on how do I get as much money working for me as soon as possible versus really splitting hairs. Because you'll hear, yep. stay around for the rest of it and we'll, we'll tell you what we mean by splitting hairs. I also want to talk about something that I've known for years when you look at all the studies out there, active versus passive, meaning index funds, is that there is a bias built into looking back historically, especially with active managers. It's a, it's a concept called survivor survivorship bias. Bo, can you explain what that means? Yeah, so what they did in this study, they only looked at funds that have been around over the last 10 years and are still around. They suffer from exactly what you said, survivorship bias. And all that is is that exists 
when a set of data looks only at survivors and ignores the ones that didn't make it, the ones that failed, the ones that fell off along the track. So what it can do is by only looking at the survivor, survivors of a certain sample set, it will allow you to draw the wrong conclusions. You may say, okay, if I'm only looking at the ones that made it, I'm not thinking about the hundred or so that started, I'm only looking at the five that made it through, you're not gonna get an accurate picture of what actually caused success over that time period. Yeah, this has been a tactic they've been using for decades, is what happens is if you have a fund that's either underperforming or it's not attracting assets from investors, they will essentially close the fund mm -hmm. down, roll the assets into one of their legacy the holdings. <laughs> well, they'll roll it into one of their more successful funds. And that's where you get to this whole survivorship bias mm -hmm. is because they're kind of, you know, if something doesn't work, they just make it disappear. Yep. So that, that, that disappears from the stats. That's why it's important to kind of really, Bo, I give them everybody a foundation. What does the research show when you take that into account, take out, you know, and just look at it year over year, how do index funds compare to active managers? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because if, if you think about uh, index funds in their form, have been a lot of them have been around for decades. But if you look at the average age of any given mutual fund, it's about 8.6 years. So it's not even a full decade. And so this study specifically only looked at the ones that made it through a decade. So it's a bit of cherry picking because we know that when you look at a study like the Spiva study, a study that actually looks at this and takes into account funds that failed. Over the last 10 years, 93% of all domestic equity funds underperform their index. That is a very different percentage of than 11 out of 16 that outperformed. 93% of funds, including the ones that started and failed, did not make it the full 10 years underperformed their given index. I also think it's interesting. I actually looked at the data because um, at the very back, I think it was like table three or something, they actually had the data points. Mm -hmm. And when I went and I pulled the specific funds that outperformed, uh, I pulled up the Morningstar reports on them, looked at the performance. This study benefited a lot from the timing mm -hmm. of the, uh, the fact that 2022 was a bad it's a year. a bad down um, year. And yeah. that, that, that bias towards what happened in 2022 really gave a lot of outsized performance that I think if you, if you opened this time frame up beyond the, the short period that was here, this might, the reversion to the mean, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, it, it probably would, would, would level out a lot of the things yep. that were found here. Um, it it back, goes back to my saying, it's better to be lucky than good, yep. meaning the timing of looking at this study was very helpful to make this headline. Now, this next point, Brian, I think you thought was kind of interesting, right? And you had some thoughts around it. The study really only looked at data from two low-cost providers. It looked at Fidelity Funds and it looked at Vanguard funds, and it was kind of interesting when you think about only using those providers, because there's something kind of unique about those providers and the way they approach well, active management. There, there was something that came to mind. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? I mean, because look, why would it be Vanguard and Fidelity? And then I started, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, th this is an interesting concept. Out of all the active managers in the universe that they could choose to compare to, they chose Vanguard mm -hmm. and Fidelity. It's almost like if you ran a filter and you said, hey, I saw that Spiva study said that 93% of you know, managers underperform the index mm -hmm. funds. What if I ran a filter to see what are the 7%, the 6 or 7% mm -hmm. that actually outperformed? And then you're like, whoa, what do you know? It's, it's Vanguard and Fidelity. And then, yeah, and then I'd ask the question of why is it the index providers that have active managers that seem to be floating to the top? And what you'll find is, like Jack Bogle, back to that interview where he talked about, hey, we just wanted to give the, the investors who can't catch the clue about how great index investing and they want some more activity, they want some more razzle-dazzle in their life. So we've created these active managers. He, he went on to say, but we made sure every one of our active active managers is low cost mm -hmm. with s no commissions, super low internal expenses. He wanted to make sure they had a low turnover because guess what? That means great tax efficiency. Mm -hmm. So I found it quite ironic that to create an active manage a management fund and strategy that beat the index funds, they essentially created pseudo index, index funds. funds, right? I mean, it's it like really is. I mean, it, so funds. why waste the calories of trying to find the best active managers 
when you can just buy the index fund that does everything that these things were designed for, and then they also let you focus on your why, mm -hmm. your goals, and you can do focus on asset allocation. And that's what it led to. Now realize, for years, I had to look at balance funds. I had to look at like Fidelity's Form 1 index because it was hard to choose an investment mm -hmm. for people, just one investment. And that's why I was so fortunate when I, I loved it when index target retirement funds came on the scene because they just they made everyone's made life easy. so much easier. But I do think that there's a bias that this study only looked at Fidelity mm -hmm. and Vanguard. My question would be, how did this professor end up with those two low cost providers as their focal point instead of looking at some of the the whole wide range of all the active managers out there. And then we've already alluded to this. Another issue that we had with this specific study is it looked at a very small sample size. They used the study looked at 16 Vanguard active funds that had inception dates before 2013. So that's small. You can imagine if just three or four funds had performed differently, it would change the whole outcome of the study. So I would make the point that with such a small sample size, it's really difficult to say active management is better than passive management. I think the SPIVA study where we look at 93% of funds are underperforming is a much larger sample size that is much more statistically significant than this small little sample size that this author looked at. Now, look, I love the headlines it created. Sure, I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it was a lot of sizzle, a little razzle-dazzle there on the headlines as well. But it, when you actually get down to the meat of it, I think that I don't even disagree with, what, with the findings. I mean, because if you are doing all the things that index funds do great at, meaning keep expenses low, keep turnover and tax efficiency in a really good place, you're going to have success. But here's a shortcut for you. Do what Jack Bogle does. Mm -hmm. Do what we do. Yep. And do what the majority of people who actually really spend time educating themselves is don't waste the calories. Don't waste the horsepower. Focus on building your wealth in other ways, and just invest in index funds. Love I mean, it. that is the easiest path to success. And by the way, that's go do some due diligence on this. This is why we like to draw attention because everybody has different needs. Everybody has different goals. But if you can educate yourselves, I, I think you'll find there are a lot of benefits in focusing on these key tenants of low expenses, low turnover, mm -hmm. and tax efficiency. They serve everyone well. I love it. We love getting to put this stuff together. We love... Uh, figuring out these sorts of article headlines, helping you guys kind of wade through what's noise and what's not noise. But we also love that we get to answer your questions. And on Tuesday mornings, that's one of our very favorite things to do. Figure out what are those things that you're curious about? How can we weigh into them? How can we add value to your financial life? So right now, we've got the team out in the wings collecting your questions and with that, I'm going to throw it over to you, Producer Reby. Excellent. I've got some questions ready to go here. If you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube. Um, that means a lot to us, and it lets us know you're out there. And with that, let's get to the questions. First up, we've got Kyle E. He says, Money Guy Show. My wife is 31, and she has all her retirement money in Fidelity Freedom Index 2055. This fund doesn't perform as well as the S&P 500. Are index funds really better? <laughs> uh, Kyle, I'm glad you're here. Welcome <laughs> welcome to the party. You picked the right show to come listen to to take a look at. So this question is, all right, my wife, she's in this 2055 Target Retirement Index Fund. And for those of you that are not familiar, what that means is that this portfolio, this fund, is going to allocate in such a way that his wife would retire in the year 2055. So right now, while we're a number of years away from that, it's going to be more aggressive. And then as we move closer and closer to the year 2055, it's going to get more conservative, more conservative, more conservative. Well, Kyle's initial question, Brian, is a great one. We get this all the time. Hey, when I look at this and I look at the 2055 fund and I stack it up against just a pure index fund, an S&P 500 index, or maybe an all-cap all, all, or a, a all cap index, it, it doesn't seem like it has as high of return. It doesn't seem like it performs as well. Well, the question you may have to ask is why? Well, because what the 2055 fund is doing is it's not just buying one asset class. It's not just trying to achieve one goal, like beating a specific benchmark. It actually has a number of different holdings inside of it that causes diversification to happen. And so what happens is when we diversify our assets, we're kind of saying, hey, we recognize we may not get all of the upside, 
But when the market freaks out and it goes down, we want to limit how much of the downside we should have. Well, what's great about the target retirement index funds is if you think about squeezing a balloon, some of these longer dated funds, the 2055, 2065s, they're going to have a lot more of that pure index exposure, but they're still going to be diversified. They're still going to take some of the risk off the table. So I'm not surprised at all that that fund is underperforming a touch relative to just a broad standard index. Well, just to give in context, I don't think it's an either or. That's what if you're choosing the S&P versus the index target retirement fund. It's an and because guess what? In that 2055 index fund, there is going to be S&P 500 mm -hmm. or a large cap yep. equivalent that's sitting in there. So you actually got that. It's just, but as you look at the broader asset allocation, all the things that Bo was just talking about, you got the large cap index, as well as a lot of international, small cap, and probably just a, a, a dusting, we'll, we'll call it a Tinkerbell dusting of, um, of bonds That's for a 2055. Term. Well, I mean, it, it is. It's just not going to be a ton. Um, but the, the, I think probably what the underperformance over the last 10 years for sure would be pr the, the, the probably 20 plus percent that's in international. international. Now, here, it's here's, okay this year but so here's far, the though. thing, Kyle, if you probably went and looked at year to date, you might be surprised to find that the, the 2055, I haven't looked, so you'd have to go do your own due diligence, but I know with such a large portion of international, you might be surprised that, 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 that it's actually doing well year to date, and that's because international is doing better than the domestic at this point in time. But that's why you also, it brings it back to the point, be careful looking at short-term periods right. on this um, because you need to be focusing on the why of your money. And, and asset allocation plays a big part. It's exactly what Bo talked about because it's risk tolerance, it's risk capacity. Is that while you're young, you want to be wide open uh, and taking a lot of risk to grow your money and try to get as much return for your compounding growth. But as you get closer to retirement, um, you want to kind of bring it in for a landing and not have the, the wild volatility because mm -hmm. your risk capacity and time to recover is just not there. And we just think while you're starting out, so you can focus on the saving as much as you can and investing as much as you can versus wasting your calories and wasting your time trying to become an investment expert, just f bring it down to how much can I save and invest? When do I need it? and just make it easy. And I think over the long term, you'll be very satisfied with the results. One little piece of that, it's interesting that Kyle said, hey, my wife has this and this is how she's investing. I have found that when I talk with couples, it's really a good idea to not think about it as like, she has her strategy and then he has his strategy. It makes a lot more sense to think about, okay, what's our overall portfolio strategy? So if her assets are invested in the 2055 fund, perhaps yours are invested the same way, but you wanna make sure that you have all of the assets in the household working together towards one common goal, towards one common plan. If they're doing completely different things, you're likely going to have an inefficiently allocated, inefficiently located portfolio. So that's something to think about as you talk with your wife about it, that. It also opens it up later when you graduate beyond the index target retirement funds and go to more custom designing your index funds and allocation for your goals. You'd be much more tax efficient yep. because then you can look at what's how much of the assets are tax deferred, how much are in after tax like brokerage accounts, and then how much are in tax-free Roth accounts and be very tax efficient. So it's not just asset allocation, it's tax allocation as well. That's what goes into this, and that's what leads to long-term success. Love it. Awesome. Good advice. Thank you, Kyle E., for your question. This next question, there's some buzz around it. Uh, this question is from Paul. He says, there's lots of talk about the dollar losing its status as a reserve currency and stock market bubble, and that we should invest outside the U.S. stock market. How worried should we be? How worried should they be and how should we be thinking about these headlines and all of the trending buzz that's out there about this right now? Yeah, I feel like this this is gathering a lot of attention right now, but I'd argue it's been gathering a lot of attention for a while. I don't feel like this is the first time that we've heard, oh, maybe the dollar is not going to be the world reserve currency or, oh, maybe this is going to happen. Uh, I think that this has been going on for a while. Was, was there a stock market question in there also or is it specifically the reserve currency? Was he asking... Um, specifically about the reserve currency, but he also mentioned the stock market bubble. Got it. Okay. And, yeah. And so should I be concerned? How should I plan for that? How should I change my financial life because of that? Well, for, let's let's talk about this from, uh, we don't do politics on this show, but it, I think it is important to recognize we live in a very political environment, especially as we approach 2024, which is another presidential election year. 
And there's a lot of talk about this. Um, and, and I think it's important because, look, America has a lot of benefits in the fact that we are the reserve currency. I mean, whenever I try, travel anywhere internationally, I just came back from Africa, they still love our dollar bills. I mean, if, when I was in Paris last year, they loved our dollar bills. Everybody, I mean, and they want our, our money. And I think it's a, it's a valuable thing to say, hey, are we in danger of losing this? Because with oil contracts and other things, it's been so valuable because if people are buying our debt and, do, and investing in, in, in our dollar, it really gives us the ability to, 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 to kind of be, you know, very healthy mm -hmm. financially. I'm trying to choose my words well because it is a hot topic sure. thing. But here's what I found when I researched this. The dollar, besides just my anecdotal world travel type discussion, we're still like 65% of the transactions out there. And, and don't forget, China pegs their currency, so it's, it's, it's manipulated it's, it's a, it, by their own you know, disclosures. Admission, I mean, yep. they, they know mm -hmm. that this is... So I, I don't know that you're going to turn that into the world you know, reserve currency if you know that it's a manipulated currency to a degree. And I know people will say, look, we, we manipulate with the way we print and the Federal Reserve and so forth. But, but that's different than pegging your currency and, and that's why I, I just think if you look at how dominant we still are on the global stage and then what, you know, and, and then the way some of the shortfalls of other currencies, I think we're OK. But I do think it is important to bring it back to say we still need our government to be smart from a fiscal mm -hmm. standpoint so that we don't look like we're, we're wild mavericks not taking that world responsibility seriously, because we're the, the, our, our, the way we manage our finances as a country it's kind of the way you look at an individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to know people are trustworthy and they're doing the right thing. And, and that, that's why it, we're not setting the stage in a good place with all the, the struggles with raising the debt ceilings, how we're always fighting on a political standpoint. I, I don't love it. I, I just don't love it. But I think overall, I still trust in the long term, humans want to expand, humans want to grow, and domestically, United States still has tons of innovation going on, but I also love a good diversified portfolio. And there's nothing wrong with you having international exposure as well. And, and you're going to make it through this. That's Just exactly where I was going to go with that. Yeah, I, and, and you, I'll let you kind of close it out with don't get distracted by the noise that you can't control. Yeah, I, you're asking, Paul, okay, what should, how should I think about this? How concerned should I be? Well, you got to step back to as an investor – Ultimately, what are we doing? We are deciding that we want to go be owners of certain types of companies. And you have to have confidence that the companies that I own are going to understand how to navigate both, uh, whether your opinion is, is, is it a, is a shrinking global economy or an expanding global economy, you have to have a conviction that I feel like the companies that I'm buying, the way that I'm participating in this environment, I trust that they're going to be able to do business. I know that I personally am going to go exchange a little bit of my time to get some dollars. I'm going to take those dollars or that currency, that wage, and I'm going to go buy something that someone else was willing to exchange some of their time for. And so long as we live in that sort of world, investors, business owners are likely going to be rewarded for that. And so when I think about some of the things we have going on in the world right now, I actually get a little bit more excited. I think that you look at this, the rate of change in technological innovation over the last 20 years, I think the next 20 years is going to look even crazier. It's going to be wilder. And the folks who recognize that and can be on the front end of that and can be patient and keep a level head and stay disciplined are likely to be rewarded over the long term for that. So I think what you do is you make sure that you cover your risks. You live on less than you make, you have an emergency reserve in place, you build wealth outside of your wage, you diversify your portfolio. And if you're doing all those things, you are controlling everything that you can control. And you have to just, those things you can't control, you kind of have to be out of sight, out of mind on those. Yeah, and where you control those is through exactly what you said, the asset allocation. That's it. Awesome. Um, great question, Paul. Thanks for being here. And thanks for asking a question. Moving on to Mystic Wolf's question. My bank has financial advisors and retirement planners. What are your thoughts on obtaining this type of support and having resources of the bank manage finances for retirement? Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And why? What should they consider when thinking about this? So I, th I think that the question, uh, the question that Mystic Wolf is asking is sort of twofold. Mm -hmm. Uh, should I hire financial? Are financial advisors good? I think they're wonderful. I just want to go on the record and say that. Uh, are financial advisors good? 
And how do I choose? How do I know which one is good? Because there's all different types. There are ones that work for independent companies. There are ones that work for brokerages. There are ones that work for banks. There are ones that work for insurance companies. How do I know the differences and how do I choose one that makes sense for me? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the first part, Brian, about when do I know, when should I hire a financial advisor? Uh, this is going to sound counterintuitive and, and, and this may be crazy because here's our disclaimer. We are financial advisors. We do not believe that every single person needs to hire a financial advisor. I think in the world in which we live today with podcasts and YouTube channels and newsletters and all this plethora of information at our fingertips, it's not incredibly difficult for folks to make really wise financial decisions early on in their financial journey. It's why we do this show so that we can equip you with that. It's why we do the financial order of operations course or the uh, know your number course. You can go out to learn.moneyguide.com to check that out so that you can kind of DIY and build it yourself. But what we have found is that as our financial lives grow and as our circumstances change, complication has a way of finding us. And so we think it may make sense to hire an advisor if you see one of three things potentially happening. Number one, the gravity of your financial decisions is so great that it makes you nervous. You know, if, if I make a uh-oh on $10,000, it's painful, but it's not going to derail me. If I make a uh-oh on a million dollars, well, now I've set myself back a few years. That may be more than I make in a year. That's maybe more than I can save over a number of years. So that's the first one. The second one is uh, life just gets busy. You get pulled in so many different directions and you keep noticing that your financial affairs keep getting put on the back burner. I don't pay attention, don't pay attention, don't pay attention. So then what you can do is hire a financial advisor to help keep things in front of you that need to be in front of you. And third is, like I said, complication finds us. You just don't know what you don't know. You used to be able to do your tax return in 20 minutes on April 14th, and now your tax return has 50 pages on, and you have all these different schedules, and you need an expert to step in and help you understand what you have going on financially. If any of those three things are happening in your life, it might make sense to hire an advisor, and you got to choose which one, which kind. Yeah, and that's what that leads, because Mystic Wolf is probably thinking, man, my cash is already at this bank. Do you know how much easy, how easy it'd be if I just work with these people where my cash already is? I could just move it all around. That That's where it seems like that would be an ideal situation, but here's here's where the, the problem arises. If you pay attention and go look at the headlines of the past, we see that a lot of our banks, unfortunately, have not only have they mismanaged some of their 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 portfolios with their cash, which leading leading to some of these failures, but they've also been inappropriate with the way they've set up accounts and done other things. I mean, I don't think I'm I'm really spreading too much tea when I share that Wells Fargo got in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. um, for opening up all these phantom accounts and all these other things that they had to settle. Well, and and it, it leads to the point of. Are there any conflicts of interest? Are there are there are the incentives of the institution you're working with misaligned from your own personal incentives? And uh, unfortunately, and this is something that kind of caught me off guard when I, I, I when I aspired to get into the wonderful world of finance, um, is that I mean this isn't a scientific number, but I, I'll just say. The lion's share, the majority of financial advisors are salespeople. Yep. They're not technicians. technicians. They're not people that are designed to give you the best design and portfolio and financial plan for what your financial life needs to maximize the opportunity. They only have to 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 exceed the suitability requirement of uh, you know what 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 kind of would work. And I always think about suitability. You know, candy bars are suitable for consumption, but nobody's going to tell you if you want to get the healthiest version of yourself, go load up on a bunch of candy bars. It just it's it's night and day. It's you, you want to hire a technician or a nutritionist if you were doing that physically. Um, the same thing happens to you financially, and that's why there is a standard out there called the fiduciary standard, where the advisor is legally required to put your interests ahead of even their own, and there's all kind of disclosures and other things. And and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, know, depending upon and what, what, how you want to look at it is that it's the independents that, that are doing this. It's not the big institutions that are doing that. They, they would much rather be the broker dealers and the, and the suitability standard versus a fiduciary standard. And that's why I want to tell you, no matter where you go in your journey, go to moneyguy.com slash resources. And we have the eight questions to ask a financial advisor. Yep. So you can figure out really quick 
where are the alignments and goals of the advisor and do those line up with what you need financially? And I'm pretty confident you're going to find out that there's a reason the wealthy go mm-hmm. to independent wealth managers. There's a reason we can create content. Matter of fact, that's actually why I started this show in 2006 is that I felt so guilty that I had minimum investments that I couldn't work with everyone who needed to know what to do with their first $5,000, $10,000, $50,000. Because that's the, that's the sad thing. Most wealth managers have high minimums because there's a lot of time that goes into mm-hmm. a true financial plan. But you know what? There's enough content out there with YouTube, with podcasting, other things. You can educate yourself. Become the best version of yourself. And then we can, if you like the money guy, we give away so much because we want you to learn, apply, grow. And I'm so confident that you'll reach a level of success the thing you'll want to take the relationship to the next level. So that's why I call it the abundance cycle. Yep. And it is, it is just continues to pay dividends. And and I love the question, Mystic Wolf, but just be an educated consumer. And I think you'll end up in the right place. Awesome. Thank you so much for that question, Mystic Wolf. Hope that helps. And we're going to move forward. This next one is a little bit of a doozy, but I think it's really important to speak to this mindset. Doozy. I'm nervous about doozy. No, I think you'll, you'll, you'll get it. You'll get it. But it's from the Money Brick Road. He says, uh, 32 years old. I want kids in the future, but hearing daycare costs is another mortgage. So that's 25% saved, 25% on house, 25% on daycare, 30% on taxes, and 8% to cars, which equals 113% in his calculation. He then says, please change my thinking. I'm fooing the best I can. In summary, uh, the Money Brick Road is in the thick of the messy middle. It sounds that way. Right? Or, 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 or is thinking, so or how is should he think about this? Yes, he's about to like... step in, right? Um, yeah, I, w- I would love to hear you speak to the people in the messy middle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start I'm gonna start big picture, and we'll see if we can whittle this down a little bit. I am of the opinion that children is not a financial decision, right? Uh, yeah. When it comes to having kids and deciding that you want to carry on your legacy and that you want to like, you know, uh, you know, create lives to come into this world financially, you should prepare financially for that. You should think through it, but I don't think it's a binary financial decision. Um, yes, I should. No, I shouldn't based solely on the financial impact. Now I do think it's one of those things, uh, that when you think about having a family and saving and taxes and all the different things that pull in all the different directions, it's easy to focus on everything, all the stuff you have to tackle. But in reality, you don't have to tackle all of those things at once. So I love you did this little exercise, 25% here, 25% here, 25% here, you know, 30% here. What likely happens is you don't do all of those things all at once. So unless you're like super high income, you're probably not paying all 30% in taxes. There's a really good chance that your effective tax rate is sub number less than that. Boom, I just found you some percentage points. Maybe when you start out on your journey, you can't quite hit that 25%, but maybe you're able to hit 15 to 20%. Boom, I just found you some percentage points. When you do 23.8 and when you go out to buy a car, that 8% of the car payment is only for 36 months. It's only for three years. So if you drive a car for seven to 10 years, that means that there are a number of years where you have no car payment at all. Boom, that 8% comes back. Just because there are all these costs that can happen, does not mean that they all happen at the same time and they all have to stay static through time. Remember, building financial independence is a journey. It's a path that you walk on. It's not a treadmill. The terrain changes. You have to adapt as you move through that. So don't let yourself be overwhelmed with all the problems that you could have. Focus on the steps immediately in front of you and start ch- uh, start marching forward, taking those first few steps. One more boom, and I was going to think we were playing Madden. <laughs> I, I, I came really close to, to, to getting some flashbacks there. But, but okay, look, let me. Um, I think it's kind of interesting. We're asking this uh, on a day y'all y'all don't know because you can't see who's in the room. But my my oldest daughter is actually here today. Yeah, there she in, is in, in the live studio audience. We don't really have a studio audience. We just have a lot of got a bunch a lot of folks of us in here. Right yeah, there's chairs. a lot of people working behind the scenes. <laughs> But it is one of those things where I, I look at, and I got to tell you, um, I mean, there's so many things. Like, there was even a story. I'm not going to say because it, it would embarrass my wife. But we were talking last night, and there was something <laughs> that my wife, you know, we were, we were talking. She can't do it anymore because, you know, the sacrifices of having 
children in the area, it, it, well, my daughter, I'm trying not to give too much detail, but she was like, um, I'm never having kids based upon some of the oh, things wow. you share. Wow. And, I, and I'm wow. like, look, I, I got to tell you, there is no greater thing. Um, it's really cool to see, see your children reach adulthood, start having some success, do things. And look, I also have, you know, a, a, a child that that has some some a special situation so she was probably not going to have the same level of success that my oldest daughter but still I love her just the same and I think you said something very key there is that you know kids are not necessarily all financial or mm-hmm. you, you said it wasn't a financial decision I I know that as a financial mutant I waited a long time to have kids because I was trying to figure it all out figure it all and out. I was trying to sure. control Everything, because that's what, probably what makes me a great financial planner, is because I do try to control. But it's also sometimes there's um, you gotta you gotta understand that you're in a moment of time, and that window, um, you know, I, I would uh, here's what I'm trying to say. If I do it all over again, I'd have probably started a little sooner. Sure. Um, because I was trying to control everything, and I love seeing the joys of having an older daughter now that I would have probably had. Uh, children sooner mm-hmm. um, also knowing the 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 you know a lot of problems with having a, a, a child with you know a special condition is that we waited so long too mm-hmm. I mean I know that 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 medically came into play but um, I I think that people need to realize a lot of times as financial mutants we are guilty just like all other humans are as we think linear we're thinking in this moment in time and I think if I could have told my 25 year old self or 26 year old self is is brian if you could see where you're going in the long term this this is you're you're worrying about stuff that's going to seem so small Mm -hmm. down the road whereas children is such a big decision think about that in in more of a long-term mindset versus just this moment of time because i was stuck thinking about the guy who was making fifty sixty thousand dollars a year not knowing the multiple that was going to come on that exponentially in the future. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to have those huge exponential growth things. But I do think that in the messy middle, we get caught in that slog that we don't realize that it's going to get better. And then you get the legacy of, 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 of a family. If you have a a spouse that you love and you have the healthy thing that you can bring all that around. So I, I would, I would not say don't think about the finance, but I'm just saying be responsible um, think long term. Think about you know what you're trying to build, what your why, what you you know how you process the world, and then you know sometimes it's okay to to to, to let loose a little bit. Love it. So yeah. I, I, that's coming from a guy who's you know now got an adult child, and um and just having a little reflection under my belt. Love it. That was a great answer. Um, think long term, and yeah, my first thought when I read this was like, okay, we got to get a little bit creative. You know, yeah, like, all right, are you right. going to knock out the car? Like, can you spend a little less than 25% on your housing? Can you save 20%? For are for all that, the daycares 25%? That's right. Yep. Get creative. Like, and, and this is coming from someone who's in the messy middle with you. So that was a great answer, guys. Thanks for tackling that. And thanks for the question, uh, Money Brick Road. All right. Jeff is up next. His question says, I'm 45 and my wife is 41. Our entire army of dollar bills are only in two buckets, pre-tax and after-tax. Unfortunately, no Roth. Are we going to be limited as we near a potential early retirement age at 55? What do you think? Um, So, Jeff, in your specific situation, if all of your assets are pre-tax and after-tax, no, you will not be limited uh, in terms of being able to retire at 55 or before 50 and a half because that after-tax bucket that you've built up, that's a great bucket that you can pull off of if you end up retiring before 59 and a half because you don't have to pay ordinary income tax. You pull that money out. There's no age restrictions. And then if your pre-tax assets are like in a 401k type structure, you're even good out till 55 because once you, if you stop working, in the year that you turn 55, you can actually begin drawing from your 401k in that year. You have to wait till 59 and a half. So you do not have limitations in terms of early retirement at 55 or pre-60. Now, the question I'd be asking is, is there a reason why maybe I should think about that Roth bucket? That third tax-free bucket that I don't have, if it's not gonna limit me from an early retirement, say, are there some reasons why I might want 
to think about getting some money in that bucket? And are there some strategies I can employ to maybe get some money in that bucket? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody wants tax-free money. I, I would mean, think so. Would, I mean, it's, there's a reason the government restricts how much you can put in and who can even put it in is because it is the squeeze of the fruit from ta- from tax-free growth accounts is that good over the long term. Because realize it's all back to if you go to moneyguy.com, Slash resources. If you if you pull up the money multiplier, I mean, you're, the exponential growth that you can do, and then if you can do that tax free, it's big I, time. It, I mean, if it's you're a financial time. mutant, that's the stuff that, that gets you really really excited. So what Bo is alluding to is is that everyone, I don't care what your income, that's the reason it's step five of the financial order of operations, is that that the, all the tax free assets, the Roth, the HSAs, um, go go. See if you can check the box on it. Now, I'm getting the feeling, Jeff, based upon the way he's, he's structured, he's probably in a high-income situation mm-hmm. to where it, it just never got to the point where he could do it from an income. But I would say, look, if all your money's 401K and you don't have IRA rollovers, you don't have SEPs, any other type of IRA, so it messes up the basis and the pro rata rule, you might be able to do what we call a, a backdoor Roth mm-hmm. or a Roth conversion strategy. But assuming, Jeff, that you've checked that box and you don't have that uh, as something you can do because maybe there's an IRA sitting out there and you you don't have a good 401k that you can roll the IRA assets up into, then I would say, uh, you know, I don't know when you plan on retiring, but you, you make it sound like it's going to be early. And that's going to mean that that after-tax account is going to be really valuable mm-hmm. Um, because you can play the after-tax and the pre-tax off of each other to try to, to control your taxes as much as possible and then even try to, to employ the opportunity um, of doing Roth conversion strategies yep. after you retire. Because realize the government's not going to force you to take that money until now 75 for somebody your age. So that gives you a lot of runway to um, really look at your taxes every year um, probably at the end of the year, that's when we do it for a lot of the clients, is mm-hmm. because you just you don't want to make this plan at the beginning of the year and then find out, oops, somebody had some extra income, mm-hmm. you know, big distribution comes your way, and then you got to figure out how you unconvert. But um, it is one of those things where I, I, I think you'll have plenty of opportunity, Jeff. But this is also um, a graduation point of the abundance cycle because this is one of the big things when when we talk about what does a financial planner do is helping you navigate the, the tax planning in, in conjunction with the asset allocation and tax location and allocation of your portfolio. All this stuff works together um, in, in a really cool way. This is some of our fun stuff when we're doing the jigsaw puzzle of, of, the, of the investment policy statement. I'm always amazed when we talk to clients or potential clients, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I missed that Roth train. I just, I, I never did that. I'm never going to have that. And we're like, no, 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 just, it's not too late. No matter where you are in your financial journey, unless you're over 75, then it gets a little bit harder, or 73 this year, you can still build Roth assets. It's not uncommon for us to see people in your exact situation, Jeff, that still between the time right now and the time that they get to 55 when they retire, can still build up six figures of tax-free assets. And then you can even convert seven figures if you have a long enough time frame. It Just because you did not do Roth earlier does not mean that the game is over for you, but you've done the good thing, at least building two of the three tax buckets. Uh, Sounds like you're in a great spot. Excellent. Um, Thanks for the question, Jeff. Next up is a question from Casey. It says, is there any considerable difference between the main target retirement index funds, such as Vanguard, Fidelity, or Schwab, or is it more important to just pick one and go with it? Uh, is there specific differences between those ones? Between yes. like Fidelity Target Retirement and the Vanguard Target Retirement and the Schwab yeah. Target Retirement. or Target, target Retirement Funds in general, because well, you have to pick one, right? Well, the first thing that I'll mention is a lot of people don't realize this. There are two different types of Target Retirement Funds in general. There are the ones that are called Target Retirement Funds, and they're actually actively managed. There's actually a manager choosing to actively manage those. We like the indexed version. So when we're talking about using target retirement funds, we're almost always talking about target retirement index funds. Because then what's happening is the manager's allocating the assets across various indices to get you the exposure that you want. So I guess the question is, if we're going to stay in the camp that we really like target retirement index funds, are there differences between Fidelity and Vanguard and Charles Schwab 
And if I wanted to see those differences, what would I go look at, or how would I go find? Well, that? For, first, let me let me go, give you the short answer, but then give you some context. Is that I'm actually going to be happy if you've done your due diligence and your research because these are the biggest providers of index That's target right. retirement funds. And I'm actually not going to pick on you if you choose any of the three. Any of them are good. But 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 here's the thing: I would tell you, don't focus just on you're you're thinking about this only in terms of performance. And I think you're going to find the delta between the performance over the long term is probably not as big as you think it is. So I, I would start looking at each of these custodians and say which one fits within my financial life to create the best version of myself. So if you like, if your if your employer has a Fidelity 401k. You know, it might make sense because it's kind of cool when everything shows up on the same mobile app, but you know, to look at that, the same, you know, Vanguard, it might be one of those things where you look at that and you go, am I okay that it's all going to be, you know, that Vanguard is the primary. I know that they can do some additional stuff, but you might, you might find out that Fidelity and Schwab can do more of some Mm -hmm. of the brokerage stuff that, that, you know, with outside assets and and instead of just dealing with a lot of proprietary stuff. Um, but it, they're all good. I mean, I just think that you need to see which one fits with your life um, better yeah, and, and it, kind of don't focus only on what fund did better in the last three months or year, whatever you're using as a, as a thing. I, I would expand it beyond just performance. Yeah, and what I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't just look at performance. What I do is I, I, there's really two metrics I'd go look at for the specific year. Let's say that you're looking in the year 2050, I do two things. I'd look at all three of those fund companies and go say, okay, what's the internal operating expense for each of their funds, right? Like, is there a significant difference or are they all probably about the same? I'm going to guess they're probably all going to be right there close to the same. Well, then the next thing I do is I look at the allocation, right? So maybe Vanguard and their investment committee says, you know, for a 2055 fund, we want there to be 35% international exposure. But maybe Fidelity says for a 2055 fund, we only want there to be 25% international exposure. And so you're just making those numbers I'm up. I'm making just those to numbers up. That, yeah. that's those, I'm, I'm pulling those out of thin air. But you can look and say, okay, when I think about the way I want my assets allocated, do I more closely align with one of these fund companies' investment committees? And does that feel like a better fit for me? Maybe I like international allocation better. Maybe I like domestic better. And you can kind of look at those glide paths to see how they change through time. Now, that's Super, super nerdy, super, super weedy. And you're probably not going to find a huge difference when you do that exercise, but it will at least equip you to be educated when you decide, okay, which one of these custodians or which one of these providers do I want to use when I select my target retirement? And, and I think if you're trying to figure out how you look at that glide path, I mean, an easy exercise is also, I mean, you can go look at their glide path. They probably published that, but, but there's also... If all else fails, you can go, you're looking at the 2050 fund, I think you said, but you can go pull the 2040, the 2030, and that's going to give you a clue of how does this asset allocation change over time. And do exactly what Bo said, then go compare those three, as well as the account features. You know, like if you want to keep cash at Mm -hmm. one, or you're going to have different accounts, a a different structure. There's all kind of cool things. I mean, there was even a period of time, I think they've all on the same equivalent now but there was a period of time like custodial Roth like if you have kids mm-hmm. there was a period of time that not all three of those could do custodial right. Roth accounts so there there are things open up your search beyond just that performance of just looking at the brochure see what features actually reflect and match what you need from this the, the service provider that's going to be kind of your partner and um, helping you house your assets as you build your your financial empire love it Wonderful. Thanks, Casey, for the question. Next up is a question from Robert. What should I do if I am just over 25% of the 25% guideline on an existing mortgage? Downsizing seems a bit expensive. How do you think about this? Um, okay, so it depends on what just over means. Is <laughs> Good just point. over 25% mean you're hanging at 27%? Or is just over 25%, meaning you're at 42%, right? Because those are different gravities around what's happening. Now, uh, housing is a big decision, and it's something that is like is significant. For most folks, your home or the real estate purchase you make is going to be the most expensive thing you ever buy. It's the largest purchase that we make. And what we recognize is that that big purchase can have big impacts on the rest of our life. So if you find that you're just over 25%, the way that I would think through the decision-making process is, okay, 
are there other areas where I can trim back my expenses to make sure I'm still saving appropriately, to make sure I'm saving in the areas I want to be saving so that I'm not just house rich and life poor? If the answer to that question is no, and I don't have a positive income trajectory, and I think that I'm always going to be likely overpaying for this mortgage, so much so that it's going to prohibit or inhibit me from being able to save for the future, then you might have to make a really tough decision. You might have to say, man, I've just gotten myself into too much house. I got to find a way to get out of this. If, however, you can trim your expenses down and you can still save the way that you should be saving and you can still do the things that you ought to be doing with your money, even if that 25% trickles to 27, 28%, 30%, I think that's okay but you have to exercise more discipline than someone else in the exact same financial situation. Mike. Well, I wrote down three quick things was uh, I want to know what their path looked like. Is this just a moment in time? And then, you know, over the next five years, you're going to get tremendous pay raises because I mean, we did Manny the mutant yep. recently. And, um, and a lot of you, I mean, and it potentially could lead to more content. When we talked about pay raises, we put 5% mm -hmm. in there. A lot of you took issue with that. Sure. Um, whereas uh, as others of you who, 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 you know, that that might reflect you, you're going to be fine with that. And that's what somebody like you, Robert, I would ask yourself, are, are you on track to get big pay increases over time? So maybe this is a moment in time that you need to figure out how you maximize the current opportunity and get yourself back on track as fast as possible. Or are you stuck? Mm -hmm. I mean, because that, that's a big... Now, if you're stuck and this is going to start unwinding your opportunities to do anything good in the long term for yourself and start building your army of dollars that can compound and work harder for you than you can with your, your back, your brains, and your hands, then that's a completely different thing. And that's mm -hmm. when... So first, take an analysis. Is this a moment in time or am I stuck? And, if you're, and, and, and once you have that answer, you can figure out if it's okay that... Okay, I need to just get serious and maximize versus I need to do big decisions. Because if you realize you are stuck, now you got to start looking at what's the cost of the transaction to unwind this. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to go into your analysis too. We know real estate that has a lot of a lot of um, friction cost. Mm -hmm. You know, you got attorneys involved, you got real estate agents, you got um, your local government. Everybody seems to have their hand out for you. So there is going to be some friction costs. So you need to figure out what that cost to, to, of the unwinding process would be. And then think about that, build that into the time to recover, because how does this all fit? And then, and then maybe there's something here with, you know, looking at, you know, Taking, am I thinking about this in short term moment in time, or am I thinking about this with a long term? Because remember, houses are supposed to be five to seven, if not even a 10 year decision with interest rates being as high as they are right now. Did you skip some of those steps so you can quickly triage and figure out what your next step forward is? And the, the, the gravity decision may not, I mean, yes, yeah, selling the house is something you may have to do to get out of, but maybe it's bringing in a roommate. Maybe it's figuring out another way to create income inside of your house to make it make sense. I know in a lot of life situations that may not be possible, but if you live in an area where the rental market would substantiate that and that would help you offset the cost of your mortgage, at least for a season, it's not the craziest idea. Why are you laughing at me? I saw it on social media. Somebody posted, and I thought it was very. They were like, it was almost like they called it a boomer comment when people said the whole roommate thing. Right. But then this person did. I love it when people have contrary takes, and I, I almost hesitate to even say this because in her video, she was sharing something that she went back talking about being nerdy. She went back and looked at the percentage of people who lived alone back historically versus now. Right. And it, it, we are in a period, and it probably does hurt against the housing market, that so many people are living alone, yeah. that, that it messes up. the. But it still sounds like a boomer comment. <laughs> just it, go get a roommate. I don't know. It just, But there is some historical context See, on the See, that's funny. Number, I but, feel like but that's I, I don't a know. trend. That's why we're a good balance, is because I'm trying to give the, the olive branch of how, because I, I think if I'm a young person right now, I'm pretty ticked off at the older generation that um, has left me with this inflation-adjusted real estate with high interest rates, and then they're, they're telling me how to figure this out. 
It's tough, but I, I do know this. You know what makes you feel better about that? What? A roommate that feels the same way that you can lament with. <laughs> yeah, buddy. In the house the good news is this is not sustainable forever. There will be, that, that's why I always tell people, if you can get your financial household in order, that's why I pay attention to the financial order of operations, you will be able when things, you know, if there's a reversion back to, to the mean of, you know, something changes, you'll be prepared. I know that sounds like a very broad thing, but I'm trying to give you the least boomer sounding answer out there. Ray, what do you think about the roommate idea? Is that crazy? No, I was I was about to say, like on TikTok, it's like, you know, hashtag house hacking. I feel like it's kind of like coming back. It's mm-hmm. like trendy now. Well, I mean, house so, hacking is like you smart, go buy honestly. a duplex and you live in one half of it or a quadplex. I mean, that's kind of what Bo's talking about. I like about. that. No, Bo's talking about, hey, you... um. You put an ad in the paper and say, hey, you want to yeah. come? Um, look, I ha- when I bought my first. That's literally house hacking. I got a bed in the house. I got a couch. <laughs> look, I bought my first house. It was before It was before I was married. I bought it as you know as, as a young single dude. And I had a buddy who was down on his luck. Great recession. Reduction of force. Like, hey, you know what, man? I got a room. Why don't you come live with me? I'll charge a cheap rent. Yeah, you remember that? And he came and he lived me for a while. It worked great. It was awesome. That's actually what I did when I first food. moved here. I was young and a coworker hey, had can, a house. She was single. And it was really this, fun, this actually. This question's way, so this might get edited out because then nobody's going to click on this clip if we keep going like this. But it, it is interesting. <laughs> Y'all, you, you realize Bo, was, Bo's, Bo and his wife lived with us. Yes. It did happen. Yep. I lived with the press. When y'all were moving up to Tennessee, y'all See? lived with us. Uh, I mean, and, and meanwhile, there's somebody, be- the big spoon story, because <laughs> somebody <laughs> ate a lot of cereal in the house at the time and used all the big spoons. By, by the way, uh, we just got a comment. And since this question's thrown away, anyways, Jake was like, put an ad in the paper. Tell me that you're old without telling me you're old, because that's not how you find roommates anymore. <laughs> so true. You were like, I'm trying really hard oh, not wait, to I'm be not a boomer. boomer. <laughs> but he Genex. said, put an ad in Woo! the paper. Pearl Jam. <laughs> That's all right. That's Nirvana. Nice. Okay. All those t-shirts you wear, I actually lived through that. Um, if you, you know like how to put an ad in a paper, rails. let me know. I don't even know if I would know I where to start. Myself. <laughs> well, that was fantastic. Honestly, good answer, though. Uh, hopefully that helps. And let's move to the next one. Zared has a question. My wife and I are 33 and 30. And we're saving 50% of our income. Wow. Um, our federal and state tax rate is 33%. Would you still recommend traditional versus Roth contributions in our 401k if we have this high savings rate? Uh, we, we cannot, Zared, make specific financial recommendations to you and your wife without knowing your overall financial situation. Here's what we can tell you, though. At a 33% federal and state tax eight my marginal tax bracket every dollar that you put into your 401k on the pre-tax side will save you 33 cents in taxes you can think about that as sort of like an imputed 33 percent rate of return right off the bat while we cannot say what specifically makes sense in your situation that is a really tough rate of return tax savings whatever you want to call it to walk away from even though you're young, even though you're 33 and 30, even with the savings rate, because you think about it, if you're maxing that out, if, if, if your number is like $22,500 you're putting in your 401k, 33% of that will save, the, of that amount will be saved in taxes by doing pre-tax. That's why we love, once you get above those thirds, we like to focus on the pre-tax side over the raw side when it comes to 401k and, that, and that's just the federal rate by the way because then if you add the state i mean think about california 10 12 percent well i think he said he was saying 33 was state and federal okay is that both okay that both I, I didn't know and then um you know and then i was trying to, to by the way try to explain to your adult daughter about the medicare surcharge <laughs> I mean, there is a conversation that you don't hear go on in a lot of households, I bet. But it's just that there are a lot of taxes out there. But but I will tell you, at the level of income, it sounds like to be able to have a 50% savings rate, it means that there's um, a lot of discipline, but also probably a decent income. I would encourage um, them to also to, to see, instead of doing an either or, to see if there's an and opportunity, meaning can you do Roth conversions? Mm-hmm. Can you do both where you're maximizing from a tax deduction standpoint, but also trying to do um, annual Roth IRA contributions? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think you can try to do both as well as HSAs. Look at your look at your situation and make sure that you you are maximizing all opportunities that are available for your household. And I would also challenge you with that sort of savings rate, fifty percent of your income. 
I would be curious to know if you actually are truly in the 33% tax bracket because what you may be thinking is this is my salary, this is my spouse's salary, I add those up and then I go look at the tax table and figure out my marginal tax bracket. Well, if y'all are both maxing out 401ks, 225, 225, it's all pre tax you might be actually driving your tax rate lower. So I would double check the math at a 50% savings rate. It's a really good chance that your tax rate could be lower than that. So you'd want to play with, okay, pre-tax versus Roth, which one makes the most sense. And then one last add-in, this is, we'll call it a sweetener, is I, I would love for you to go check out on learn.moneyguy.com, our Know Your Number that's course, great. because at 50% savings, that's great if you think you're going to retire at 45 or 50 years of age. But I do want to make sure if you have a more traditional sense of like 60 years of age is when you go retire, just to go see what that savings rate looks like. So you, you can go ahead and start <laughs> having those healthy conversations um, cause I've shared with you guys, my wife and I are very heavy on the savings accelerator for in our twenties and thirties, but then in our forties, we, we have enjoyed life better. And I just want to go ahead and give you a head start. It could be that carrot for the future, but also, so you know, what are we saving for and what's the why and how does this fit in with some of the other life goals with children, travel and, and, you know, and everything else that goes on with having a long-term mindset. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Zared. Moving on to Romeo's question. It was disappointing to see a drop of about 13% on 2022 net worth statement. Even after saving 30%, maxing out his Roth IRA, 401k, and after-tax savings. Am I doing something wrong? Talk me off the ledge here. Um, yes, you are doing something wrong, and this is what it is. You're not, you're not thinking about this the right way, right? You're not thinking about this the right way, because he said, uh, Romeo said he had a 30% savings rate, right, Reeves? 30% mm-hmm. savings rate in a great. year where the market went down. I'm going to use just a broad number, about 20%, right? Significant pull down in 2022. I would think about that 30% of my income that I was plowing into the market, I was buying cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I was loading that spring. And like, if I did, now I don't encourage you to do intra year net worth because I like big surprises at the end of the year. But I bet if you looked at your statements as of today, halfway through 2023, all that money that you saved last year, probably looking pretty good right now. So while you are in the accumulation phase, while you are still building your portfolio, volatility is your friend. Downturns are your opportunity. Financial mutants will look at that and say, man, this is the year where the dollars are made. This is where the things get exciting. You don't care about in the year over year if it goes down 13% because you know that means that when it pops, if I've loaded that spring, that uptick on the next up year, when it turns around, if I keep saving, is going to get really, really, really exciting. So, um, I, I keep trying to get this to stick, and I'm going to use it again. Um, when this type of stuff happens, it just means your portfolio is in concentrate. You know what, what I mean by that? You know, think about when you're a kid. Oh, I know. I, I, <laughs> no, no. Keep nobody buys it this no, no, way no, no, anymore. No. You used to have to mix your orange juice. You used to come in little containers, and you'd have to mix it with water. You know, it was still orange juice, but it was just concentrated. And, and that's what happens to your portfolio. When you go through down markets, it doesn't mean the value, you know, what it actually, the total intrinsic value has gone away. What it means is, is that the, the crazy prices that get yelled at you every day on what it's worth has just had some fluctuations. Mm-hmm. I, I've brought in Warren Buffett's <laughs> farm story with my we own concentrate. orange concentrate story. But it doesn't mean, Romeo, that, that necessarily the value was lost. It just means that it's been compressed down, hence the spring mm-hmm. that Bo was talking about. I will tell you, here's another life experience share. Um, with charitable giving post-2008, you know what shares, when you do specific gifts, that it, it cracked me up when you, when you looked at what shares it wanted to give always were those shares that were at the lowest mm-hmm. points. Because when you look at what happened to the market in 2008 and then the recovery, because remember, and, and, and I'm going to do this because I'm, I'm now old and I pull old stats because that's what I remember. And I think the number is even higher. The first 12 months after recovery, pre-2008, it was like 26.2%. If you add it up now, I think post-2008, that number sprang up to, to 33% mm-hmm. or something like that. And, and the majority of that happened in the first like two or three months. 
So I would tell you, Romeo, look, we're in this period where we still have this cloud over the economy. We're still waiting to see what the Federal Reserve does with interest rates, what happens with inflation. But here's what I know. Uh, the law of, accelerate, law of accelerating returns, and you look at, you know, just like we ushered in the Internet, we ushered in the mobile phone stage where everything, computers went in our pocket. we got all kind of new stuff coming in with artificial intelligence and other things. There's going to be ways to make money off of that. And you're going to see that your portfolio that, yes, was down to flat um, during 2022, which was not a good financial year. It's going to it's going to you're going to look at that and it's going to be some of your best performing shares. Can I, I want to give you one other piece of advice of one way to like flip the script and think about this differently. Find a community where you can talk about this kind of stuff and you can hear from other folks because you realize most folks last year, their net worth went down. Like a lot of folks, if it's a testament to how big your portfolio is, if a downturn in the stock market causes your net worth to go down, that's a testament that you've done a really good job saving. You've built up a significant net worth that actually downturns do affect you. What's great is when you can talk with other mutants about that. Now, I don't know about you, but most of your friends, you probably can't say, hey, what'd your net worth do last year? How much did you save? But you know where you can do that? in our Financial Mutant Facebook group. It's a private group available for you guys that have purchased courses, that have purchased products, so that you can talk to folks, say, hey, you know, last year, my net worth went down. Anybody else seeing that? And what you're gonna hear is, oh yeah, yeah, mine did too, mine did that, mine did that. And you're gonna hear people that are going through the same exact thing, but are excited because they know what the rest of the story is going to look like. So I would encourage you, instead of like getting lost in your own mind, surround yourselves with folks who can also say, man, I'm doing the same stuff, making the same hard decisions, building on the same path and the same journey as you are. It's going to be okay. We're going to rock this thing and we're all going to retire together. Kumbaya. Fantastic. Kumbaya. <laughs> Romeo, truly though, thank you for your question. Thanks for being here. And I hope that help, helped just shift your perspective. Next up, we've got a question from JM. He says, I have too much cash. What? No, go. My wife's initials are JM, so I thought I was thinking. Cute. Uh, I was thinking in terms of JM School of Accounting at University of Georgia. <laughs> but keep going, Well, this JM. is like J, the name J. I thought, J, thought of accounting. Yeah, J-A-Y, and then last oh, initial J, M. His yeah. name's J. Got it. Oh, okay. Got it. So, well, that's very different. That's, that's different than JM School of Accounting also at different University than of Georgia. Jenna Murray. Really glad we cleared that up. <laughs> J, I'm going to ask your question. He says, I have too much cash. I'm new here and haven't followed Foo until recently. We've saved, but not invested. So my extra quote unquote cash is mostly in CDs, but they're expiring soon. Is our brokerage account the best option for me or what should he do next? You know what's great about the Foo, the financial order of Ooh. operation. That one. You know what's great about it? It's never too late to start. It's never too late to go back to step one and start at step one and start saying, okay, do I have my deductibles covered? Okay, I got too much cash. Yep, got that. Employer free money. Okay, am I doing step two? Am I getting that free match? Okay, good. I'm doing that. Step three, high interest debt. Do I have credit card? Okay, good. I'm going to knock that. And just go through the financial order of operations. I would argue, say, man, I'm, I'm new here. By the way, welcome. We love to have you. And I feel like I haven't been doing that. What should I do? My very first piece of advice to him would be start at the beginning and work through the financial order of operation to see what step you get to. Now, I bet one of his questions is going to be, well, I got all this cash. If I'm going through this, does that mean I just like, I have been sitting there and I just dump all this in? Like, like I'm, I haven't been investing. Is me just taking all this cash I had and just investing tomorrow, is that the best idea? Is that the thing that yeah. I'm doing with it? And Jay, you can go, go look at some of our content. We've actually talked about dollar cost averaging versus lump sum. It depends upon how big this this lump sum or this amount of money is. If it's if after you go through the financial order of operations and knock out like Roth funding for you and your spouse and you know making sure you got the employer match, and looking at those basics, if, if it's still a significant sum of money, I'm talking about life changing. We're talking about probably six figures and above. Um, you might want to spread it out over, you know, you figure you have to think about your comfort level and, and how, you know, and we've got, like I said, there's all kind of research on this, but you can figure out what your period. I would not encourage you not to go too much longer than 10 months because mm -hmm. there is a lot of um there is some showings that if you spread your dollar cost averaging on a lump sum too far, um, just know that, that inherently 
Markets make money eight out of ten years, mm-hmm. so so you can imagine that that does come into play. But if you want to spread your your risk out, nothing wrong in that. Um, I want to congratulate you. Is that I, I've shared my story, and that I grew up in a household where my parents were incredible savers. I mean, that's where I think I get my financial mutant core tenants and, and my disciplined life. Um, skills from, but my parents never knew how to invest. Mm-hmm. They bought CDs. That's all they knew how to do. And um, and I think that, that that's why I always talk about, you know, speaking of a rich dad, poor dad, you know, you hear about that book. Um, but, it, but this is different in the fact that my, um, you know, my parents didn't invest. Meanwhile, my father-in-law just had one investment that he was loading it up, um, not even loading it up at a large sum, but it's just that fun, way outperformed mm-hmm. cash. And somehow they ended up in a very similar, if not even my father-in-law, in a much better situation, even though I think if you looked at the dollar saved, my parents would probably They, they were behaviorally, tighter. yeah. They were um, behaviorally strong. So it, it's just one of those things where I congratulate you and welcome you to the world of watching your army of dollar bills get more and more powerful and build the great, big, beautiful tomorrow. That that because remember we always think linearly as as humans, but you've got exponential growth in your future, and that's that's just exciting stuff. I always think that's a moment of celebration when, when that that comes your way. That's awesome. Thanks for your question, Jay. Um, hope that helps. And welcome. Let me ac- re-echo the welcome from Bo. Glad you're here. Um, okay, question from E Littles is up next. It says, "What is the best path I can take to be a financial advisor?" Is this an occupation you would suggest for someone who likes to help others with money? And then he says, is college necessary? What does it actually take? Um, One, I, I love doing this for a living. There's nothing else in the world that I'd rather do. I think it's so fun. You get to do math. You get to, you know, work with money, work with dollars, and you get to help people. And like those three things are like pretty, they get me super, super juiced up. So I love being a financial advisor, I love this vocation. I would encourage anyone who thinks they might have an affinity for it to for sure pursue it. Now, what's required to do it and do it well kind of varies a little bit because it depends on what you really want to do, which side of the business that you want to go into and where you want to plug yourself in because you can go work and be a financial advisor or you can work and support a financial advisory firm or you can go out and be a product salesman. And, you know, there are uh, merits to each one of those. It depends on what you ultimately want to do. If you were going to tell somebody, Brian, Hey, I'm thinking about cracking into the industry. I'm thinking about doing this. What are some of the first things that you would tell them to do? What are some of the first things you'd tell them to think about? Well, man, there's a lot there. Cause first of all, Wonderful world of finance. It's it awesome. a great career. I, I, but, but I think there's several ways to get there. I think you can, now you can do financial planning degrees, um, I think you can do, I come from the accounting background. I got my, my own niece in the, focused on the accounting because mm-hmm. I think that uh, accounting is the world, is the language of business. So it's valuable. But but somebody who's in another career, um, we have a lot of career changers mm-hmm. that come our way too. Here's what I would think about is first do your research on the industry as a whole because financial advisors are not all created equally. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, sadly, the majority of our industry are salespeople. They're not technicians. I think a lot of people, when you hear about financial planning, in your mind, you think that everybody's getting to do financial planning all day and they're trying to maximize their skill set and get that 10,000 hours to become experts. Um, but that's that's actually the unicorns of the industry. If you go look at how many are, um, advisors are fiduciary, um, fee-only type advisors like what our firm is, I think we're only like 2 to 3% Very of the entire percentage. industry. Um, you'll find out the majority of financial advisors, unfortunately, are straight up salespeople. And that's why I, I would guard if you go down this path, any place you interview, I would ask them, hey, at what point are you going to ask me for a list of my friends and families so I can start soliciting them? Um, if that comes up in the interview, I would get the heck out of that situation as fast as possible because. Um, you need the 10,000 hours. You need the four to five years of doing this um, to become an expert and develop mastery before you start hitting up your friends and family. But unfortunately, a lot of indus- our industry is set up to, as soon as, I mean, I think within three months, they get you, they get you licensed. 
um, to pass some tests, and they pay you a salary during that licensing period. But then after that licensing period's over, <laughs> they say go out and get they, it. They go um, write down a hundred of the people you know with, that might be able to become clients and start dialing dialing for dollars or emailing. I don't I don't think anybody dials anymore, do they? They call or email, whatever the new finagled way that you you start going through your friends and family, and that's why you see such a big washout rate within financial advising. People do it, burn through their their friends and family, and then those institutions get to keep the, the clients, your friends mm-hmm. and family, and you go wash out and go do something else. So I would just make sure you do the research on how you're going to enter the industry because it's not the easiest thing. Um, but now that I've thrown cold water uh, on that, you know, but, uh, you know, but uh, let me give you some good news. First, you can go do your due diligence. You can go look at NAPFA mm-hmm. and other um organizations that focus XY planning and other things that are fee only type organizations, see if they have any conferences in the neck of the woods You can go to those conferences, be around other financial advisors to, to, to see what it's like. But then That's um, what I was going to say, one of the easy things you could do is try to find financial advisors that you know, and try to have coffee with them, have lunch with them. Hey, what's the day in your life look like? For most of the career changers that we've talked to, we tell them seek out someone, not necessarily a mentor relationship, but somebody to ask, Hey, what do you like about it? What's your day-to-day look like? What do you not like about it? And then as you de- begin to figure out, do I actually like this? I don't think it's crazy to go shadow somebody. And we've had a number of people that have done that. Hey, can I just come like hang out with you for a day and kind of see what it is you do and how you do it to see if it's something I love? Because I think that makes a lot more sense than just somebody running out and going to try to get a degree in financial planning before they actually know if it's something they really want to do. Well, you might not need to go get a specific degree on this, especially if you already have a degree in some other subject matter, because there's all kind of professional education courses that can Mm -hmm. can help you qualify. And then I was going to put out there, because it's crazy for us not to say it, go to our website, go to aboundwealth.com or moneyguy.com. We do have a career section, and, and maybe your path, not, not to become just a financial advisor, we have those financial associate roles out there, but also if you just want to be around financially minded people, like I know we have a, 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 a systems mm-hmm. jobs out there, we have content jobs, I mean there's all kind of opportunities that we're growing our family as well, it's just, but make sure your eyes are wide open um, and, and it can become, if you do it the right way and, and the opportunities open at the right places, um, it can become one of the most fulfilling careers mm-hmm. in the world. And that's why I have, you know, I always try to get, you know, friends, family, and relatives talking about it, especially when I find out the young people who are bright. I'm like, don't, don't overlook the wonderful world of finance because everybody's always like, I, mean, I have several neighbors that I ask, you know, bright, bright students. And I'm like, what do you go do when you grow going to medical school? I'm like, you don't want to go to the wonderful world of finance? <laughs> you know, it's, um, I don't know. I'm an advocate for it. So I always share, you know, go do your research and then good luck. Love it. That's great. Thanks, E. Littles, for that question. You got I know you're about, probably about to close us down. Right. Are you, I am. Uh, so before you do that, I do. <laughs> I do want to say one quick thing. While while we're, we have a very special friend of the show, Chi, who's got some some mm-hmm. medical things going on. I just want, Chi, we're thinking of you, and um, you mean the world to us. And um, I know tomorrow will go well, and I just want you to know. You, you just I don't know it's something that was on uh, top of mind, and I, I would just want to give a shout out to Chi. And and if you guys, I know he's very involved in our our Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you guys be positive and encouraging because, I mean, we all take our health for granted until there's a struggle. And sure. having a, losing my father when I was in my 20s, and I, I just know that there is something well beyond the dollar bills that we all deal with on a day-to-day basis, and, and that's the balance. And I just, I don't know, it just felt like it rose to the level that it was worth giving a shout-out to, to one of our mutants out there. Love it. Well, Awesome. If you want to continue this conversation, I know we gave a shout out to a lot of different free resources. You can find those at moneyguy.com slash resources. And uh, spoiler alert, we barely even scratched the surface to what's there. We can't mention them all on every show. So definitely go check that out, moneyguy.com slash resources. They're all there for you whenever you need it. And then if you are ready for the deeper dive that we talked about, the Facebook group where all the financial mutants are talking and um, a deeper dive on foo and actually knowing your number, learn.moneyguy.com guy.com definitely check that out too we love doing this every week love answering your financial questions we'll be back tuesday 10 a.m answering some more
I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, rest of the Money Guy team. Money Guy, out.